Okay, so today we're talking about uh, Chapter 24, Asepsis and Infection Control. The things you need to learn from this chapter are the infection control cycle, uh, the stages of an infection, identifying patients at risk for developing an infection, being able to describe nursing interventions used to break the chain of infection, identifying situations in which hand hygiene is indicated, identifying multi-drug resistant organisms that are prevalent in the hospitalized patient and community setting, uh, list nursing diagnosis for a patient who has or is at risk for an infection, describe strategies to implement CDC guidelines for standard and transmission-based infection precautions when caring for patients, and implement recommended techniques for medical and surgical asepsis. So as healthcare providers, uh, we worry about spreading uh, microorganisms from person to person and place to place. They're naturally present in almost all environments. Not all of them are harmful. It depends on the type of organism, its location, the host, and the circumstances involved. Prevention infection itself is a major focus for nurses and the quality and safety education for nurses has identified safety as one of the leading issues in healthcare. Uh, part of that focus on safety includes effective e infection control practices. So nurses help identify, prevent, control, uh, and teach the patient about infection and infection control practices. Uh, using the nursing process in is critical in helping to break the uh, cycle of the uh, infection process itself. So what exactly is an infection? This is a, a disease or a disease state that results from uh, the presence of pathogens, which are these uh, disease pr producing microorganisms that are either in or on the body. And it occurs as a process of a cyclic process. It has six components. Uh, that are listed on this page here. Infectious agent, which is the bacteria, the virus, or the fungi. The uh, reservoir, which is that uh, natural habitat of the organism where it lives naturally. Um, you know, the type of environment. Uh, the portal of exit, which is the point of escape for that organism. Uh, how it's transmitted, and this can be either through direct contact, indirect contact, or airborne route. Uh, the portal of entry, which is uh, the point at which the organism enters into a new host and a susceptible host. Uh, this is what the, um, the host that uh, must overcome resistance mounted by the hostess defense. So the organism has to uh, overcome this susceptible uh, host resistance um, in order to be effective. So uh, bacteria, that's the most important and the most common observed infection causing agent. Okay, and it can be categorized in a lot of different ways. Um, they're categorized by shape. So it's usually like spherical or cocci, uh, rod shape, bacilli, corkscrew, uh, uh, known as spiroquets. And it can either be gram positive or gram negative. Uh, gram positive have a thicker cell wall and it can uh, resist. Um, decolonization or decolorization and um, gram negative have a more complex cell wall and they can be decolorized by alcohol. So um, that's just how we um, do how we mark them when we do use something called gram staining when we're looking at them. Uh, another way that um, bacteria is described is by its need for oxygen for survival. So most bacteria uh, require oxygen to live and grow. And so they're referred to as aerobic. And then uh, bacteria that lives without oxygen is called anaerobic. So we look here at the uh, infection cycle. It's demonstrated as a chain. And uh, the goal is to break the link in the chain to end the cycle. So, um, you know, it's a big chain, a big circle. Uh, so if we um, do hand hygiene, right, that's our number one way to control, all right? So we wash our hands. Also, we wear gloves, masks, or appropriate gear, okay, protective gear, and we properly dispose of needles. 
um, if, immuni if immunizations are received by the healthcare workers. Um, if, you know, hand hygiene, sterilization, antibiotics, and antimicrobials are used against those infectious agents. Um, Transmission-based precautions. So we use protection against that. Um, we use dry, intact dressing, hand hygiene, uh, gloves when we come in contact with body fluid. We cover our mouth and our nose when we're sneezing. So all these things uh, protect us against different things. Uh, hand hygiene, uh, use pesticides to eliminate vectors. Um, so that can eliminate means of transmissions, portals of entry. The hand hygiene can eliminate with the uh, susceptible host and the infectious agents. The immunizations can help with the infectious agents and uh, so on and so forth. Now, a virus, that's the smallest of all microorganisms. It's only visible within a microscope. It can cause several infections, including a cold, hep B, hep C, uh, AIDS. Okay, antibiotics do not work on them. And there are some antiviral medications that are effective with some viral infections. Uh, usually they have to be given in the prodromal stage and they can shorten the uh, full stage of the illness. And then uh, fungi, these are going to be uh, plant-like organisms, molds and yeast that cause infections. They're present in the air, the soil, the water. Uh, sometimes um, we might see these fungi or these fungal infections and recognize them as things like athlete's foot, ringworm, or a yeast infection. They're treated with anti and fungal, with, I'm sorry, with antifungals. Um, however, some infections due to fungi are resistant to the treatment. Uh, and then parasites. These are organisms that live on or in a host and they rely on nourishment. Malaria is a serious disease that occurs when a parasite infects a certain type of mosquito and then it begins to feed on a human. So um, the organism's potential to produce disease in a person depends on several factors, the number of organisms, uh, the virulence or the strength of the organism or its ability to cause the disease, uh, the competingness or the competence of that person's immune system, how well that's working, uh, the length and the extent of the contact between the person and the microorganism. Which of the following is the most significant and commonly found infection causing agent in healthcare institutions? So bacteria is the most significant infection causing agent in the healthcare system and it can be categorized by shape to the reaction and by the need for oxygen. All right, remember bacteria is the most significant and most prevalent. Um, the virus is the smallest and the plant is that fungi-like organism that's present in the air, soil, and the water. Uh, again, bacteria is classified by its shape. So it can be spherical, known as cocci, rod-shaped, known as bacilli, or cork-shaped, corkscrew-shaped, known as spirochets. And it can be gram positive or gram negative based on its reaction to the gram stain. Uh, aerobic means it needs op, op, oxygen or anaerobic means meaning that it does not require oxygen to live and grow. All right, so now we're talking about factors affecting the organism's potential to produce disease. We talked about the number of organisms. We talked about the virulence or its ability to cause the disease and um, the competence of the person's immune system. So if I'm immunocompromised, I might be more at risk for this organism. Also the length and the intimacy of contact or you know, the amount of exposure that the person has to the microorganism. Possible reservoirs for microorganisms include people, uh, animals, soil, food, water, milk, and other inanimate objects. 
All right. So some other people act as reservoirs for an infection agent. They may show signs and symptoms of the disease, and they may be the reservoir for the agent, but don't exhibit any manifestations of the disease. So if they don't present with the signs and symptoms, then they're considered a carrier. Uh, carriers are often asymptomatic and will transmit the disease. For example, there's people that have tested positive for HIV. Now, they don't show any signs and symptoms of the disease, but they can still transmit it. They may even have um, um, AIDS, okay? And it may not occur for years, um, those signs and symptoms, okay? But they still can transmit the virus to other people through activities such as sexual contact, um, sharing contaminated needles, or uh, an infected pregnant woman can transmit the virus to the child during uh, pregnancy, birth, or breastfeeding. All right, so other reservoirs um, are like the rabies virus. That's an example of a pathogen whose reservoir is other animals. So like dogs, squirrels, bats, raccoons, um, people contract the rabies virus if they're bitten by one of these infected animals. Uh, the West Nile virus is another example of a pathogen whose reservoir is usually an animal, so often it's birds. The mosquitoes feed on the infected birds, become infected, and then pass the infection on to people uh, when they feed on their blood. So the first local transmission of Zika virus was reported in 2015 in the Caribbean. It's also transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, the same way as the West Nile virus, okay? And it also can be transmitted from pregnant women to their unborn baby. Poor pregnancy outcomes and microcephaly are often um, effects of this transmission of this Zika virus. So um, we definitely want to be careful. It can still, um, according to the CDC, even be transferred through the sperm. Um, Okay, water also can harbor things like uh, Giardia or Shigella, and if you drink or swim in that contaminated water, it, you can become infected or it can start that process of being infected. Soil also can act as a reservoir for organisms um, that cause ga gas gangrene and tetanus, and food can also be a reservoir, like undercooked beef, um, green leafy vegetables have also been identified for things like E. coli infections. Um, because uh, of where they're grown, picked, and um, sometimes not washed. All right, milk can contain things like listeria, especially if it's not pasteurized, and then um, recent outbreaks of foodborne illnesses can be caused by things like E. coli. Uh, inanimate objects can also harbor organisms like influenza viruses. Uh, they can be spread from person to person if the person touched a contaminated article and then their eyes or nose. All right, so we have to be careful about um, the ability to transfer organisms from one person to another, especially if you have things like artificial nails um, or um, something like that these artificial nails can harbor you know a ton of bacteria underneath them so if we're not doing uh, effective hand washing or proper glove use um, we could expose an immunocompromised patient to the risk of an infection uh, just by having those nails so which infection or disease may be spread by touching a contaminated inanimate article So influenza, okay, it can be spread if a person touches a contaminated article and then their eyes or nose, okay. So common portals of exit uh, include um, the respiratory, GI, and geratorinary tracts, as well as any break in the skin. Blood and tissue can also be portals for exit or pathogens. Uh, there are several different stages of infection. 
All right. Uh, the incubation period. This is where organisms start to grow and multiply. Uh, the prodromal stage. This is when you're most infectious and um, you might have vague or nonspecific signs of the disease. And then the uh, full stage illness where you have a presence of specific signs and symptoms of the disease or the convalescent period where you start to recover from the infection. So the incubation period, um, that's the time from when the pathogen enters the body and the appearance of symptoms start to uh, occur. During that stage, again, um, it's growing. It's growing, it's multiplying. Uh, the length of incubation can vary. Um, for like example, the common cold might have an incubation period of one to two days, but something like tetanus could be as long as two to 21 days. And then the prodromal stage, the pr stage when the person is most infectious. Okay, so early signs and symptoms of the disease are often present, but they can be vague, nonspecific, and these can range anywhere from fatigue to malaise, low-grade fever. It can last from uh, several hours to several days. Uh, the patient is often unaware that they're contagious during this stage, and so the infection begins to spread to other people. Um, during the full, full stage of illness, uh, we see the full signs and symptoms of the infection, okay, and the type determines on the length of the illness, the severity of the clinical manifestations. Symptoms are limited or they occur only in one body area and are referred to as localized symptoms. Um, and symptoms manifested throughout the entire body are referred to as sy systematic symptoms. And then we have the uh, convalescent period. Uh, this involves the recovery from the infection and it varies according to the infection, the disease and the patient's overall condition. Signs and symptoms will disappear. The person returns to a healthy state, um, but depending on the type of infection, there could be a temporary or permanent change in the patient's uh, previous health condition. Okay, so, um, and that may remain even after the convalescent period. So again, you know, we would want to eventually try to get them back to that previous level of functioning, but it may take a while for that to happen. Um, and a person can go through the four phases with the same uh, process, such as herpes simplex. There may have been only one exposure, but the infection may continue to cycle through the phases uh, for a lifetime. So during which stage of the infection is the patient most contagious? So the prodromal stage, the patient is most infectious during the prodromal stage when early signs and symptoms of the disease are present, but they may be vague or nonspecific. During the stage, the patient doesn't even realize he or she is contagious and can spread the infection. So there's a lot of um, defense mechanisms in the body, okay, that protect us from invasion, and we're going to talk about those, okay. Um, one is the skin and mucous membranes. They're part of our first line of defenses. Other ones are our uh, body flora, um, particularly the flora in the GI tract. This helps uh, prevent against harmful bacteria. Um, it stops it from invading the body. And if um, a pathogen is able to make it past these first line defenses, then we have the inflammatory and the immune response that may help us um, fight or combat the infection. So the inflammatory response is a protective mechanism. It helps eliminate invading pathogens. It helps our tissue to repair, um, and it helps the body uh, neutralize, control, and eliminate these um, agents that are attacking us 
and help prepare that site uh, for repair. In addition um, to the infection, uh, the inflammatory response also occurs in response to the actual injury, and it can be an acute or chronic process. So the hallmark signs of acute infection are usually redness, heat, swelling, pain, and sometimes loss of function, and that usually appears at the site of the injury or the invaded area. Uh, the body's response occurs in two phases, uh, the vascular and the cellular phase. So in the vascular space, phase, we have these small blood vessels that constrict. Um, this is followed by vasodilation of the arterioles and the venals that supply the area. And then we have an increase in blood flow. Uh, this results to redness and heat in that area. Then histamine is going to be released, and that causes uh, an increased permeability of the vessels, meaning that more things can leak through or squeeze through the cell. So that allows a protein-rich fluid to pour into the area. Um, at that point, uh, pain, swelling, loss of function can occur. Uh, during that cellular stage, the white blood cells or the leukocytes are going to move into that area very quickly. Neutrophils, which are our primary phagocytes, these engulf the organism or eat it, consume that cell debris and that foreign material. Then exudate, which is made out of fluid, cells, and inflammatory byproducts is going to be released from the wound. This exudate might be clear. It could be serous or clear. It could have red blood cells, also called serosanguinous, or it might have pus. It might be purulent. So the amount of exudate is going to depend on the size and the location of the wound. Um, so that's that liquid you see squirting out of the wound, known as exudate. Okay, the damaged cells are then repaired by either regeneration, by replacement with identical cells, or by forming scar tissue. Uh, we also have the uh, immune response. This is another type of protective mechanism in the body. In the normal immune response, uh, we have the collective response of the immune system to that invading organism. The complex mechanism that constitutes this immune response as the body tries to protect and defend itself. Uh, the foreign mechanism material is called an antigen. And the body commonly responds to antigens by producing an antibody. So it's called the antigen antibody reaction, also known as humoral immunity. And this is a component of the immune response. The other component that helps the body defend against invaders is called cell mediated immunity. And this type of immunity involves an increase in the number of lymphocytes or white blood cells that will destroy or react with other cells in the body that the body recognizes as harmful. As these complicated chemical and mechanical responses are not completely understood, it is known that they help defend the body against bacteria, viral, and fungal infections, as well as malignant or cancerous cells. The septic susceptibility of the host will depend on the integrity of that skin and those mucous membranes which help protect the body against this invasion of these foreign objects. Uh, pH levels of the GI tract and the gerontinary tract as well as the skin because these can help fight off uh, microbial invasions. Uh, the integrity and the number of the white blood cells so um, remember, if our white blood cell count is low, we won't be able to fight as well. Also, if they're not mature, okay, it's going to affect our ability to fight these pathogens off. And some diseases do cause us to have immature white blood cells. Um, other things, our age, our sex, our race, our heredity, those uh, influence our susceptibility. Uh, whether or not um, we're a baby or an older adult, uh, those people tend to be more vulnerable to infection, okay? Uh, do we have all our immunizations? Were they natural or were they acquired? Okay, because that can affect um, how long they're going to work and how much they're able to resist the infection. Uh, are we fatigued? 
Uh, what is our nutritional and our general health status? Um, have we been um, pre-screened? Do we have any pre-existing illnesses? Uh, do, have we received previous or current treatments for the same illness? And what other medications are we on? Like, are we on any immunosuppressants that might affect our ability of our normal defense to work? Uh, things like a spleen. Do we have a spleen? Um, how's our stress level? Are we able to cope effectively? Um, and then we want to use safe, non-invasive, non-indwelling medical devices first, okay, because these prevent um, opening up a reservoir for this host, for this bacteria, for this virus, for this uh, um, thing to jump into our system, okay. Um, it gives us a source of entry, okay, and we don't want to allow any extra sources of entry. So, like when our patients are immunosuppressed, we have to be extremely cautious, Okay, and then we want to um, teach our patient about health habits that promote wellness, that can reduce risk factors, uh, that can decrease um, the susceptibility to a host. So those are things like uh, good nutrition, adequate rest, exercise, uh, stress reduction techniques, engaging in personal hygiene habits like hand washing, um, and uh, keeping our immune system built up. Um, not engaging in risky practices like unsafe sex or sharing IV needles. Um, those are dangerous habits and they give an opportunity for a pathogen to uh, enter the host's body and cause an infection. So uh, for planning, the nurse is going to develop uh, patient outcomes after she reviews her assessment data or his. Um, they're going to consider uh, the cycle of events that uh, ended up causing the infection. Uh, they would need to incorporate principles of infection control. So when we plan outcomes to prevent infection, we need to uh, disrupt the infection cycle. And how do we do this? We teach things like uh, good hand hygiene. Um, being able to identify signs and symptoms of the infection, teaching people uh, adequate hygiene, um, influent, in, uh, um, adequate nutritional and fluid intake, uh, using um, proper disposal of soil articles like um, tissues and uh, wound care products, uh, dressing changes and stuff like that. Um, so our nursing interventions also have to be focused on controlling or preventing infection because these can uh, positively impact that patient outcome. All right, so other things that we have to think about is using the appropriate cleansing or disinfecting techniques, uh, making sure that we're uh, verbalizing the awareness of uh, getting proper immunizations. Um, you know, so we talk to our patients about the flu shot, about the pneumonia shot, and other important immunizations. We um, teach them about stress reduction techniques. We also teach them about um, following, you know, isolation uh, protocols um, and other uh, CDC guidelines for um, PPE and hand washing and um, preventing that spread of infection to other people. Uh, making sure our equipment's clean, and making sure that visitors aren't sick when they're coming into the room or um, that they're uh, following the proper protocol also if our patient is some, some sort of isolation precautions. And then um, making sure that our patient understands, you know, about health risks associated with latex allergies. Again, um, those cardinal signs of the acute infection are redness, um, heat, swelling, pain, and loss of function. So, you know, these hallmark signs of the acute, of, of the acute infection. Um, the increase in blood flow results in redness and heat to the area, okay? Uh, histamine is released, and that causes an increase in the permanent permeability of the vessels. And at that point, the uh, swelling pain and the loss of function can occur, all right? Vascular and cellular phases occur. In the vascular phase, the small blood vessels constrict that's followed by vasodilation of the arterioles and the venals that supply the area. 
that's that increase in blood flow that causes that heat and that redness. All right, and then in this cellular stage, we have those white blood cells or those leukocytes. They move quickly into the area. The neutrophils, those are those uh, Pac-Man or those phagocytes that eat the organism. They consume that cell debris and that foreign material. Uh, the exudate is composed of that fluid, the cells, and inflammatory byproducts, and it's released from the wound. The exudate, exudate can be clear or serous. It can have red blood cells or serosanguinous, or it can have pus or be purulent. So the amount depends on the size and location of the wound. And then the damaged cells are repaired by regeneration, by replacement with identical cells or formation of scar tissue again. So laboratory data indicating infection. And when I look at my cells, um, I try to keep them in order. So I do a acronym called Never Let Monkeys Eat Bananas. And that helps me um, keep the percentages from the most to the least. So neutrophils is the highest amount. And then lymphocytes. And then monocytes. And then eosinophils. And then basophils. So never neutrophils let lymphocytes monkeys, monocytes, eosinophil, eat, and basophil, bananas. Never let monkeys eat bananas. That's how I remember it for 20 years now. All right, so we're looking at the um, neutrophils, okay? So an increase in an acute affection um, will produce pus um, and also uh, increased risk for acute bacterial infection if decreased. Um, also might be present in response to stress. So that's your neutrophils. And then uh, lymphocytes, um, these are increased in chronic bacterial and viral infections. So I'm sorry, neutrophils are about 60 to 70% of the blood cells. The lymphocytes are about 20 to 40%. Uh, monocytes are about 2 to 8%. Eosinophils, 1 to 4%. And then basophils, 0.5 to 1%. The monocytes are usually increased in fungal uh, scavenger or um, phagocyte severe infections. The eosinophils are usually in response to an allergic reaction or a parasitic infection. So you might see like the eosinophils in a um, anaphylactic reaction. Um, basophils are uh, usually affected by infections. Also, we have um, ESR, which is um, the red blood cells, okay? So um, that's going to be elevated, the ESR rate, when there's inflammation present. So white blood cells will be elevated um, in an infection. The normal is five to 10,000. Uh, in somebody that's pregnant, it might be a little more, and in infants, um, it might be a little bit different, but in a normal adult, our normal would be five to 10,000. Um, it can be increased in specific types of white blood cells, like I just talked about, uh, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, or basophils. And then um, elevated urethrocyte sedimentation rate. Uh, so I just said when that's elevated, there's usually a presence of inflammation. And then... Um, presence of pathogen in urine, blood, sputum, or draining cultures. So, you know, we do the blood work or we collect the urine sample and we check it and we find that there is a pathogen present in it. So um, medical asepsis is a technique used uh, when inside and outside of healthcare facilities, and it's based on the assumption that pathogens are likely present. So um, we don't do things like share drinking cups or um, we make sure we're wiping things down. We make sure we're washing hands. We're doing things um, that would break the cycle of infection to provide safe patient care that protects the patient and you from any microorganism that can cause the disease. So we limit um, 
the dissemination of pathogens or things that would um, cause the transfer of pathogens from person to person. And the easiest way to do this is by using barriers that prevent the transmission of the pathogen. So barriers help uh, decrease the spread, and these include hand hygiene, uh, personal protective equipment, and other barrier techniques. So hand hygiene is the most effective way to prevent the spread of the infectious agent. Um, you know, so it's um, consensus that healthcare workers uh, transmit a lot of uh, pathogens through um, contaminated hands. So we have to make sure that we are constantly washing and hand sanitizing our hands. And, um, you know, you want to use soap and water whenever possible. Um, if you can't or don't have access to soap and water, then you can use alcohol if you need to. You do have to be aware that um, at least for C. diff and maybe a couple other things, um, hand alcohol is not uh, effective. So you do have to wash your hands. For certain things also if your hands were soiled um, with blood or body fluids you would want to um, also wash them thoroughly okay um, also the world health organization uh, determined um, five moments for hand hygiene and those five mo moments include before you touch a patient uh, before a clean or aseptic procedure after body fluid exposure risk after touching a patient and after touching a patient's surroundings so those are the five times when you definitely should wash your hands so um, bacterial flora are found on the hands um, and it comes in the form of transient bacteria and resident bacteria. Uh, trans, transient bacteria is usually easily removed through hand washing. And um, we have the potential to adjust the environment of the skin when they're present in large numbers over a period of time and can become resident bacteria. These are found like in the creases of the skin and they might require friction with a brush to remove. In order to uh, prevent this transient bacteria from becoming resident bacteria, we have to remember to wash our hands whenever they're visibly soiled and after every contact with any type of contaminated material, as well as every time we remove our gloves. Um, and um, we have to be cautious with artificial nails, okay, because they're likely to be associated with higher bacterial counts and um, when you wear them in the operating room, it's actually considered a citable offense from the Joint Commission. Uh, natural nails should be worn and they should be less than a quarter of an inch long. For several different reasons, um, certain hospitals or several hospitals, um, for some reason, um, have patients that develop these uh, hospital-acquired infections, okay? Uh, the most common ones are catheter-associated urinary tract infection, surgical site infection, central line-associated bloodstream infection, or ventilated-associated pneumonia. Um, now, they consider these infections to be preventable, okay? And um, the reason why is because most of them are caused by um, bacteria um, and it can be traced to some invasive device that we used on the patient. For the example, the catheter-associated urinary tract infection, that is one of the most common um, types of healthcare-associated infections. All right, and it's caused to that uh, indwelling catheter. So we have to use um, strict infection control measures um, and stick to uh, our recommended practices. Now, the source of these uh, healthcare associated or hospital associated infections 
um, can be either from within the hospital or out of the hospital. So we call that exogenous from an external or endogenous from within. Okay, so if the causative organism came from uh, someone else, it would be considered exogenous. If it came um, when the causative um, from some micro life that was harbored within the person, then it would cons be considered endogenous. And if the infection um, resulted from some treatment or diagnostic procedure, then it would be considered iatrogenetic. So most of these uh, hospital acquired infections are caused by bacteria like C. diff, E. coli, Staph aureus, uh, Streptococcus, uh, Pseudomonas, and Klebsiella, and they can be traced to those invasive devices, like I said, such as the uh, catheter or such as an IV um, catheter, okay, or a ventilator. Uh, we have these things called bundles. These are evidence-based practices that have proven um, positive outcomes when used together uh, to prevent infection in these patients. And um, the ANA has an initiative um, for prevention of COTI that outlines three specific areas. And one of them is prevention of inappropriate short-term urinary catheter use. In other words, um, if we don't need the catheter, we don't need to put it in. So a lot of times they're used for short-term use inappropriately. So if we could stop that, we could stop some of those infections. Also, uh, removing the catheter in a timely uh, frame. So as soon as it's possible to remove it, let's get it out. And then um, doing proper catheter care when it's in place. So these initiatives uh, have resulted in increasing um, um, the care, but they still saw um, an increase in infections, even though they tried to put focus on um, increasing better care in these areas. Okay, so um, they're looking at other ways, you know, other actions that they can do to try to prevent infections in these patients. Um, be sure to check what your facility because um, mandatory reporting of health care associated infections um, is required in the majority of states. and um, the reports contain specific data about um, which ones are reportable, uh, but particularly the ones that we just talked about. And then um, on the link in your book on page 609, um, you can look up to see what are reportable, which ones are mandatorily reportable in your state. Um, and then um, we look at things to um, prevent. So what kind of environmental factors can we change? Um, what would be um, the nature of our innovation? Uh, can people, you know, in our facility make the change or help to make a difference? And what kind of or organizational factors would we have to put in place to help make these changes um, to prevent these patients from being at risk? Now, um, other things that we have to think about are multi-drug resistant organisms. Um, these are um, increasing significantly, okay? And um, people are becoming more and more resistant to different classes of antibiotics. And um, originally we were able to effectively treat these infections, but now we're using these uh, broad, broad spectrum antibiotics and um, we have these uh, bacteria that were once susceptible to these uh, bacteria now can fight against these antibiotics. And so um, the antibiotics that kill bacteria um, that cause illness, they also can kill good bacteria that protect our body from infection. So um, we can develop uh, drug resistant bacteria um, that can grow and share the drug resistance with other bacteria, and that can complicate the treatment. So some of these are um, MRSA, VRE, and um, carbaminin, 
resistant entero back to CRI, also known as CRE. Okay, so um, these um, core actions have to be taken against these um, resistant strains, and the core actions are to prevent the infection, uh, thereby preventing the spread of the resistance, um, tracking you know, how we're treating these diseases, improving antibiotic prescribing, and we use something called antibiotic stewardship, and then we develop new drugs and diagnostic tests. So we're trying to come up with ways to treat these infections because after a while, what's gonna happen is somebody's gonna scrape their knee, get an infection, we won't be able to treat it, and they're gonna end up dying um, from that infection because we're not able to treat it. So uh, VRE, um, this is one of those types of infections. Um, it's been around for a little while. Um, so the person um, develops um, a drug resistance okay and um, they're no longer sensitive to an antibiotic and um, so they get this resistance to the antibiotic okay and um, the patient that is most at risk are people that have things like kidney disease diabetes maybe they had a previous MRSA infection uh, they have an invasive catheter or uh, recent exposure to vancomycin so um, they also may have prolonged hospitalizations, okay? Um, VRE is a serious pathogen, and um, enterococci is a series, a series of streptococcus. It's found in the normal intestinal and GI tract, and it can cause healthcare-associated infections. It also has a high mortality rate if the organism becomes vanco-resistant. As the enterococci uh, continue to mutate and develop um, this resistance, okay, it becomes resistant to drugs like vancomycin, ampicillin, and gentamicin. And then um, providers try to uh, develop and target um, the medication with drugs like linozoid, uh, trying to treat the infection and reduce complications. So risk factors for VRE include a compromised immune system, uh, recent surgery, use of invasive devices, prolonged antibiotic use, especially vancomycin, and prolonged hospitalization. Uh, it's spread from contact with the feces, the urine, or the blood of an infected or colonized person, and healthcare providers should ensure prompt recognition, diagnosis, isolation, management, and infection control. Assessment, intervention, and evaluation of high-risk patients and situations to minimize the infection and reduce unnecessary suffering on, uh, certain, on the patients that it's affecting. Uh, next, we're going to talk about C. diff. Uh, according to uh, national data, there's a 10% decrease in C. diff between um, 2011 and 2013, but the rates of infection still remain high. All right, so, um, and now we have bouts of this occurring outside of the hospital. So that makes it a little bit more difficult to uh, track. Um, both symptomatic and asymptomatic people uh, also serve as reservoirs for C. diff as do surfaces or objects that are contaminated with the feces. The organism can reside in the intestinal tract and when antibiotics, especially those broad spectrum antibiotics are taken for a long period of time, uh, helpful bacteria are destroyed, allowing the C. diff bacteria to grow out of control. Uh, that causes a bacterial imbalance. So these patients will present with watery diarrhea, fever, mild abdominal cramping, um, some are more common signs and symptoms, but the severity of the C. diff uh, depends on the specific strain. So prevention is the key. Uh, general strategies that help reduce uh, indirect transmission include uh, not using things like electronic equipment that is difficult to clean, such as electronic thermometers, uh, disinfecting dedicated patient care items and equipment like stethoscopes, using full barrier contact precautions such as gown and gloves, putting patients in private rooms or 
cohorting patients with the same strain of C. diff and performing uh, meticulous hand hygiene. Remember that C. diff is not killed by alcohol-based hand rubs. Soap and water are required. We also need to perform environmental contamination of the room and educate all healthcare providers and their families on the clinical presentation, the transmission, and the causes of the C. diff. Remember, it's fecal oral. In addition to uh, recognition of the C. diff and the prevention of transmission, um, best practice involves measured use of antimicrobials, uh, prescribing them at appropriate dose and only when indicated. So using that antibiotic um, stewardship, okay, so we don't destroy all the normal flora of the gut. Uh, disinfecting, sterilizing to help break the cycle of infection and present disease and prevent disease and then um, we can use different types so disinfection will destroy all pathogen organisms except the spores the sterilization destroys all of the microorganisms including the spores All right, so remember that um, the body's normal flora in the GI tract helps keep potentially harmful bacteria from um, invading the body. And um, then if it makes it past that uh, normal flora, then it's going to um, create the um, initiation of the inflammatory and the immune response. So remember, the inflammatory response is a protective, protective mechanism that eliminates the invading pathogen and allows the body to repair its tissue. Um, it helps the body neutralize, control, or eliminate the offending agent and prepare the site for repair. Um, in addition to infection, the inflammatory response also occurs in response to an injury, and it can be acute or chronic. So hallmark mark signs of infection include redness, heat, swelling, pain, and loss of function at the site of injury or invasion. The body's response in two phases are responsible for the hallmark signs, the vascular and cellular phase. So again, in the vascular space phase, those small blood vessels constrict in the area followed by vasodilation of the arterioles and venules that supply the area. That increase in blood flow results in redness and heat to the area. Histamine is released, causing increased permeability or allowing you know, things to flow freely through there. You get that protein-rich fluid or that exudate, and at that point, swelling, pain, and loss of function can occur. And then in the um, cellular stage, the white blood cells are going to move quickly into the area. The neutrophils... Remember, that's the highest number of white blood cells. Uh, they're phagocytes. They're going to engulf that organism and consume that cellular debris and foreign material. The exudate, then composed of fluid cells and those inflammatory byproducts, is released from the wound. That can be clear. It can be red uh, or have red blood cells and look serosanguinous. Or it can be purulent and contain pus. The amount depends on the size and location of the wound. Remember, in the immune response. Okay, so in this um, immune response, it's another protective mechanism. And the collective response of the immune system is responding to this invading organism. We have a complex mechanism, okay, as the body attempts to defend itself. Remember, we have the foreign material which is the antigen, and then um, the antigen causes the body to respond and produce an antibody. So this is known as humoral immunity, the antigen-antibody reaction or humoral immunity. And that is one component of the immune response. 
The other component that also helps the body defend is called cell mediator. And this type of immunity increases the number of lymphocytes or white blood cells that will destroy or react with the cell that the body recognizes as harmful. So both of these responses are going to help the body um, against fight against bacterial, viral, and fungal infections, as well as malignant and cancerous cells. So factors that determine whether we sterilize or disinfect and what type of method that we use are the uh, nature of the organism present. So the CDC re recommends that... Um, Supplies like linens and equipment uh, be treated as if the patient were infectious. So certain organisms are easily destroyed and others um, require certain types of disinfection or sterilization methods. We also have to consider how many organisms are present. So if we have more organisms, it's going to take us longer to treat it. Also, what type of equipment do we have? So equipment that has small lumens, crevices, or joints uh, require special handling and, and care so we don't destroy the equipment. Also, um, what is the intended use of the equipment? So is the need for medical or surgical asepsis and where are we going to be using it at? Are we using it in the home or are we using it in a healthcare facility for several different patients? Um, what are the available means for sterilization and disinfection? So the choice of chemical or physical means of sterilization and infection depends on the nature and number of organisms, um, how the equipment is going to be used and the type of the equipment, as well as the availability and practicality of the means. So see table uh, 24, 3 in your book. This lists different types of methods for sterilization and disinfection. And then um, time uh, is a key factor when you're sterilizing or disinfecting articles. Failure to know the recommended time period is grossly negligent. Uh, tell me whether the following statement is true or false. So soaps and detergents or non-antimicrobial agents are considered adequate for routine medical cleansing of the hands and removal of most transient organisms. True or false? So the answer is true. Soaps and detergents, non-antimicrobial agents, are considered adequate for routine mechanical cleansing of the hands and removal of most transient organisms. Uh, PPE, personal protective supplies. So gloves, they're not a substitute for washing your hands. They should only be worn once and then discarded according to your facility policy. And then the hands have to be meticulously washed after. So you're washing before you don them and after you don them. Um, when nursing activities do not involve soiling of the hands with body fluids, gloves are not necessary. Activities like turning a patient, feeding the patient, vital signs, and changing IV fluid bags do not require the use of gloves as long as there is no potential contact with body fluids. However, whenever there is a possibility of soiling the hands with body fluids, gloves must be worn. Gowns are usually worn to prevent soiling of your clothing by the patient, their blood, or their body fluids. They are a barrier protection and are donned immediately before you enter the patient's room. Individual gown technique is recommended. The technique involves wearing a gown only one time and then discarding appropriately according to facility protocol. A waterproof or impervious gown is used if there is an increased likelihood of contact with blood or body fluids. If a gown becomes heavily soiled or moistened with blood or body fluid when caring for a patient, remove it, perform hand hygiene, and put on a clean gown. There is no single special technique for applying a gown used as a barrier, but recommended practices for removing a soiled gown are recommended are described in Skills 24-2 on pages 624 to 628 of your textbook. 
Uh, masks. Masks help uh, us from inhaling large particle aerosols um, that travel a short distance, usually about three feet, and small particle droplets, okay, um, which can remain in the air and travel a little bit longer distances. Mask can protect the patient and the healthcare worker from respiratory secretions. They discourage the wearer from touching the eyes, nose, and the mouth and limit contact of organisms with your mucous membranes. Various practices are used regarding masks. For instance, um, in some places, all personnel and the patient's visitors wear a mask while in the patient's room and in other situations, the patient wears the mask when transported outside his or her room to protect other healthcare workers and personnel or other patients from exposure. A mask is typically only worn once and never lowered around the neck and then brought back over the mouth and nose for reuse. How long one can wear a mask while caring for a patient is subject to debate. Regardless of the time worn, a mask must be changed before it becomes damp from the wearer's wears exhalations. A respirator is a specific type of mask that filters inspired air. Surgical masks filter only expired air. One of the most commonly used masks is an N95, which is designed to filter out particles as small as 1 mcm with 95% efficient, efficiently and fits comfortably around the face. The elastic strap on the respirators provide more protection and a better fit than the ties on a regular surgical mask, but fit testing is required. Protective eyewear such as goggles or a face shield must be worn whenever there is a risk of contaminating the mucous membranes of the eyes. For example, suctioning a trach or assisting with invasive procedures that may involve splattering of blood or other body fluids. This requires protection for the caregiver. Plain glasses are unacceptable because uh, side shields are required. Handling and disposal of supplies. Used equipment can be disposed of after, if reusable, bagged according to facility policy. Send it to the central cleaning area and sterilize or disinfected. Double bagging may be required if the single bag is not secured or if soiled on the outside. A contaminated item must never be used for another patient. There's your N95. Standard precautions. In addition to specific barriers, we also have something referred to as standard precautions. And this should be used in the care of all hospitalized patients, um, regardless of what their diagnosis or their infectious status is. And they apply to all blood, body fluid secretions, and excretions except sweat. So everything wet except sweat, regardless of whether the body fluid is present or not, or the blood, okay? Um, additions are respiratory hygiene, uh, cough etiquette, safe injection practices, and directions to use a mask whenever performing a high-risk or prolonged procedure that involves a spinal canal puncture. Um, so, you know, we want to use these all the time. Transmission-based precautions are used in addition to those standard precautions um, for anybody with a suspected infection with a pathogen that can be transmitted by airborne droplet or contact route. Uh, CDC guidelines include a directive on how to don PPE when you enter the room of a patient with a transmission-based precaution and how to remove that PPE when leaving the room. Uh, the categories recognize that the disease may have multiple routes of transmission. Three types of transmission-based precautions include uh, airborne droplet or contact. And they may be used um, alone or in combination, but always in addition to your standard precautions. Tell me if the following statement is true or false. 
Standard precautions should be used when caring for a non-infectious post-op patient who is vomiting blood. True or false? Okay, true. Standard precautions should be used when caring for a non-infectious post-op patient who is vomiting blood. So for airborne precautions, okay, um, this would be things such as uh, TB, um, varicella, uh, chickenpox, rubella, measles. Okay, we're going to put the patient in a private room with negative air pressure. Um, we are going to use a respirator when we enter the room. Okay, we are going to transport the patient out of the room only when necessary, and we'll use a surgical mask when we do that. And we'll follow CDC guidelines, especially um, for the TB strategies. Uh, for droplet precautions, um, these are uh, infections spread by large particle droplets like rubella, mumps, diphtheria, and the adenovirus infection in infants and young children. We use a private room. Um, if available, the door can remain open. PPE when we enter the room for all interactions that involve patient contact or contact with potentially contaminated areas in the environment. Uh, we transport the patient only when necessary and use a surgical mask on the patient. Uh, keep visitors three feet from the infected person. And for contact precautions, uh, we use these for patients infected or colonized with a multi-drug resistant organism um, like VRE or MRSA. Uh, the person is put in a private room if possible. Uh, PPE when you enter the room for all interactions that involve contact with the patient or contaminated areas in the environment. Change gloves after contact with any infective materials. Uh, remove the PPE before you leave the room. Wash hands with an antimicrobial. And um, limit movement of the patient out of the room and avoid sharing patient equipment. Um, also, um, aseptic technique we're going to talk about. Um, this includes activities that we utilize to break the chain of the infection. And there are two main categories, medical asepsis or clean technique and surgical asepsis or sterile technique. So uh, medical aseptic technique, that's appropriate for most of the things that we do in the home with the exception of like self-injection or uh, venous dialysis catheter care. Okay, um, some of those would require surgical asepsis, but uh, the patient has to make adjustments and improvise with resources available to his or her use. Um, the nurse will emphasize hand washing and other hygiene practices that help uh, interrupt the infection cycle. To satisfy OSHA requirements, uh, home care facilities often have a full-time or part-time infection control officer, and um, they'll um, dedicate or design plans for the nurse to put in place and for employees to um, reinforce with patients to make sure that we're following uh, the basic principles of asepsis. Okay, so um, for the patient um, to um, involve medical asepsis in the activities of daily living. Um, we would want to talk about one, personal hygiene, and then some other practices would be things like washing their hands before and after um, they prepare food or eat, uh, preparing foods at high temperatures enough to ensure that they're fully uh, cooked and safe to eat, uh, make sure that um, they're washing their hands, cutting boards, utensils with hot soapy water, uh, before and after they handle things like raw poultry or other meats um, to make sure that they're keeping foods properly refrigerated, especially those that contain things like mayonnaise, that they're washing any raw fruits and vegetables before they serve them. Uh, they're using pasteurized milk uh, because unpasteurized can lead to listeria and um, fruit juices. Uh, also, um, washing their hands uh, after they use the bathroom and uh, using individual personal care items like washcloth, cloth, towels, and uh, toothbrush brushes as opposed to uh, sharing with other people in the household.
Now, uh, surgical asepsis or sterile technique um, principles can be found on box 24-6 of your textbook. And this talks about things like um, only allowing sterile objects to touch other sterile objects um, to prevent contamination, uh, opening sterile packages so that the edge of the wrapper is directed away from the worker so you're not leaning over the sterile area. Okay, avoid spilling solutions onto the cloth or the paper that's used for the sterile field, um, keeping objects above the level of the waist, uh, avoiding coughing, sneezing, talking, or reaching over sterile fields, um, not walking away or turning your back towards the sterile field, keeping all items sterile that are brought into contact with open skin um, or items that are used to penetrate the skin, and use dry sterile forceps whenever necessary. Um, consider the edge outer inch of a sterile field to be contaminated and consider an object contaminated if you have any doubt as to its sterility. So use of a surgical um, Asepsis would be included in places like the operating room, uh, the labor and delivery area, cert during certain um, diagnostic testing or in certain diagnostic testing areas, um, sometimes at the patient bedside if we're doing something like um, a urinary catheter, a sterile dressing change, um, maybe we're doing a thoracentesis, we might be preparing and injecting medications. Um, when we're teaching the patient about care at home, okay, very important to talk about hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. So we went over some of these um, things for medical asepsis, but we're just going to talk about it again since it's up here on the slide. And that's, you know, washing those hands before they eat or prepare food, uh, foods at high enough temperatures that we're cooking it thoroughly. Uh, use of care with the cutting boards and utensils, so we're washing those, especially if we're cutting things like poultry. Um, you want to wash in between the poultry and anything else. Make sure you're washing your hands and all the equipment down. Um, keeping our food at the right temps, especially foods with mayonnaise. Uh, washing our raw fruits and vegetables before we eat them. Using pasteurized milk and fruit juices. Washing our hands after the bathroom. And of course, as nurses, we usually wash it before the bathroom too. Because we, you know, get in the habit of washing our hands before and after everything you do. And then um, we um, use individual care items. We don't share things like toothbrushes, wash washcloths, towels, those kinds. Of Evaluating patient goals. So as the primary caregiver, we as nurses can intervene. We can positively affect a patient's outcome. We're able to assess patients that are at risk, help them um, through or by selecting an appropriate nursing diagnosis, planning care for them, uh, intervening to make sure that we're maintaining a safe environment, and then we can reduce uh, their potential for developing an infection. We're going to evaluate the person's safety needs, um, make sure it's being met effectively. We're going to help try to maintain a secure environment for them. And we're going to look at the patient to see, are they able to use medical asepsis, asepsis correctly? Are they able to identify um, health habits and lifestyles that contribute to their disease process or that might make them healthier? Are they able to state the signs and symptoms of an infection and be able to recognize and identify when they should notify you or the physician? Um, are they able to identify unsafe situations in their own home environment and either correct it or alert family members or you uh, to help them correct those situations?